Hey guys, my name is Frank. This is the Poth on Programming Video Log, and today I'm going to be doing part one of my four part series on tile based collision detection shapes. So, as you can see, I have this cool example set up with a bunch of different collision shapes, and the player interacts with all of them quite nicely. I've got half tiles, got full tiles, got slope tiles. I even have curved tiles on the bottom here. And I have platform tiles, of course, that you can jump through the bottom of and not fall through the top of or through the side and not through the other side. So what I want to do in this tutorial is just go over one more time my tile-based collision detection broad phase method that uses routing functions. And I've gone over this in older tutorials, which I, I will link to in the description if you want to watch those as well. But I just feel like I've made a couple tweaks to it, and I want to go over it all again just to give you guys an overview before I get into the narrow phase collision methods that handle the actual collision detection and response between all these unique individual shapes. So I'm going to jump right into the code here. I'm not going to go over the controller or the display object. I'm just going to go straight for the game object, which has all the information about the map, the game logic, and everything. And I'm going to explain what's going on here. So here is my one-dimensional tile map array. And as you can see, it has a whole bunch of different tile values inside of it. So basically what happens when you do broad phase collision is you need to figure out what tile value you are standing on to decide what type of collision method you want to run. So the map is made up of columns and rows. So right now I'm in column, if I count, I'm, I start at zero, so I'm in column zero, one, and my player is clearly in column one. If I move him over a little bit, it'd be more apparent. He's in column one, he's in row, if I start counting, a zero, one, the top left corner of this player is in column one, row one. So I want to test that. That would be a tile zero because column one, row one is a zero at that location. But he's also in other tile spaces, so I have to test those as well. I have to test every corner of my player object. And if my player object is bigger than the tile spaces, I'm going to have to test more than just his corners. I'm going to have to test all the tile spaces he's standing over. So the method I use for that, I'm going to go over in a little bit. Uh, but just, just understand that for a player character or a player sprite or hitbox that's smaller than your tile size, you only have to test the top right, top, or top right, top left, bottom left, and bottom right corners. So all the different corners of your hitbox. So now I'm going to go down to my, well, my collider object. And inside the collider object, I have different routing functions. I might as well go over this while I'm here. I have different routing functions. So those tile values you saw in the map correspond to these routing functions, as well as graphics in the graphics sheet. And I'll show you that real quick. Here's my graphics set. Pretty simple. It's just a PNG image with 16 by 16 tile images inside of there. And I just cut those out and put them on the screen where they go. I'm not going to go over how to blit stuff. I'll do a tutorial on that later, though at a later date, because that's important to know how to do too. So anyway, I've got these routing functions, and basically the broad phase says, hey, my top left corner of my player object is in column one, row one. I convert that into map, one dimensional map coordinates, and I get the value in the map at that map index. And it says, hey, that value is a one, or actually this value would be a seven. So I come down to my routing function labeled seven, or actually, that would be in uh, COM1 row 2, which is what I'm colliding with. But let's go with uh, COM1 row 2. So COM1 row 2, I'm standing on a 7 tile. So my broad phase would hand 7 into my routing function or my collider object and call the function labeled 7. And that function is going to call the collide top narrow phase collision function and perform narrow phase collision detection for a top surface at half of the tile height. But I'm going to get into the specifics of that in a later video in this series. So how do I determine which corner is in what tile space? I'm going to come down to my game loop and just go over it from start to finish. Here's my game loop. On every execution of my game loop, I get controller input. I add a value to the velocity depending on which key I hit. I update my player position. I keep track of the old position. Keep that in mind. Um, 
I'm going to do a little bit of collision detection with the sides of the world so I don't jump off the world. And finally, after I update the location of my player, I'm in a new spot. I'm going to check to see if he's colliding with anything with the game.collider.handleCollision function. So let's take a look at that function because that's the one that handles all of our broad phase collision. So this is that function it's inside of my collider object. It just takes the object that I'm, I'm going to be colliding with the world and the area which contains our map data. And I just go through every corner in my object and I convert that corner in real world space into a column and a row value that fits my map. And then I can I convert that into an index inside of my map. So this test top section tests the top left corner and the top right corner of my player object. So the top left corner is going to be at object.x and object.y. So right here in my square. Divide that by tile size. And let's say that uh, well let's do let's do a, a real world example here. Right now the x position of my player object is probably at 17. So 17 divided by tile size, which is 16, is going to be 1.116. And when I do math that four on it, it's just going to round down to 16. Well, 16, well, actually, it would round down to one because 17 divided by 16 is one point something rounded down. It's just going to be one. So I know that I'm in column one, and that's accurate. This row, the top left corner is going to be, or the Y value is going to be, let's say it's at, it looks like it's kind of at 25 or so. So 25 divided by 16 is going to be 1.5 something or whatever. Round that down, it's just gonna be one. I know that I'm also in row one. So this top left corner is in column one, row one. Top right corner does the same thing. Maintains the value for the top because that's not changing. And it just gets the, the column of the right side and uses those values to convert to an index. And you can check out those older tutorials for a better explanation of how to do this. I'll link all those videos in the description. So basically what this does for broad phase is it just loops over, it doesn't loop, but it goes over all my corners and converts them to column and row space and then tests those columns and rows against my map to get a tile value. And when it gets that value, it calls a routing function this refers to collider, so this is basically the equivalent of saying collider, uh, and it calls the function labeled with the value. So if I come back up here a little ways, 14, say I'm over a tile uh, value of 14, which is this curve tile here, the broad phase is going to detect that this bottom side, this bottom left corner of my player character is inside of this tile space, which has a 14 value it's going to call the function labeled 14 in my collider object. And then that is going to execute some code, which is the narrow phase code. So really simple. Now I'm going to go over some problems that you might encounter with this method, because this method is not without problems. Just like any method, usually they all have problems. There's no one size fits all solution that's super efficient and awesome. So if I go over all this, I'm testing the top, I'm testing the bottom, I'm testing the left, and I'm testing the right. But I'm also testing the same corners more than once. So if I just run down this and check out what's going on here, this checks the top left corner of my object. This tests the top right corner of my object. This tests the bottom left corner of my object. This tests the bottom right corner of my object coming over here and I'm going to test the same corners all over again. Or wait, uh, yeah, okay, I did have those right. I think this is the bottom right, yeah. This here is going to test the top right corner and this here is going to test the right bottom corner. So I'm actually testing all these twice and the reason for that is initially in my old way, in my old method of doing this, I would only test the right side if my player was moving to the right. And I would only test the left side if the player was moving to the left. So it made good sense. But when you do this, you actually lose quite a bit of precision. So if I come up here and hop onto my special case tile, and I move down to a very specific location that hopefully I can get to quickly right here, it looks like I'm actually should fall off the tile. I should fall off the tile like this, but really, 
the left side of my player object is on top of my tile. So it is actually responding appropriately. And believe me, I looked at the numbers and I tested this because I was like, it should fall through, but really it's actually standing on top of that tile. And this is the desired behavior. I guess you could find a way to change it, but this is mathematically the right thing to respond with here. And to get that precision, I have to test all these different corners. And the reason is because of what they call tunneling. And if you look up tunneling, you'll you'll see what it is. Basically what it is, is say you have a bullet object and you shoot a bullet and that bullet moves really fast. If it moves, let's say your tiles are 16 by 16 pixels wide and your bullet is moving 32 pixels on every frame. Theoretically, if you shoot it starting right here and it's moving to the left, and it moves 32 pixels, it can move all the way over here. And it passes, it jumps right over this tile and never even checks to see if it hit it because it never knew it was in the tile space. It just moved right through. So you should never have an object that moves fast enough for tunneling to be an issue. But the reason this became an issue with these sloped tiles is because you get so close to the other tile space that if I'm starting out here and on the next frame I'm moving down here, I'm going to check for collision with, with this tile space rather than this tile space. Unless, of course, I check all of my corners, and then it's going to detect that this corner is inside of this tile space, and it will do a collision check, which will yield the appropriate response, which is what you're seeing. So hopefully that was a good explanation of why checking all these corners twice prevents tunneling. Um, you really don't have to check all of them twice. That's really overkill. If I were to come up here and or come down here and comment out all of this code, I'm going to show you why I kept it in, but it's a very uh, specific problem that I'm avoiding here with the tile that I'm actually sitting on right now, but because it's kind of a weird tile. So if I comment this code out and I come over here to this tile, oh, I'm going to have to get back there, jumped a little too far. If I come over here to this tile, you're going to see a problem. I can move through the bottom side of my tile. Now the, the right side of my tile, I can move right through. I shouldn't be able to do that. And normally if I'm just moving a standard direction on, on the X axis, it's not going to let me through. But if I do a very specific motion, like I just did, I pass right through the side of that tile, which you don't want. And the reason for this is because I'm not checking my corners for the Y and the X axis, I'm only doing it for the Y since I commented my left and right test. And the reason this you need to test this, even though it seems like huge overkill, is because if I just do a Y check, it could, the way I have my narrow face set up, it does X and Y collision response, but it's either gonna do X or Y. So if it does X, there's still a potential to miss a collision on Y. And if it does Y, there's a potential to miss a collision on X. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's doing Y collision, response and it's ignoring the exclusion response so I can go right through the uh, right side of my tile here. If I comment this code back in, it's going to do the left and the right even though it is kind of overkill and I will no longer have this problem. All the other tiles seem to work fine by the way if I don't check X and Y because of the way I have my methods set up but to be very thorough, you want to do this, and there is still the chance that this can happen with your other tiles. It just it might be one in a thousand chance, but even one in a thousand chance should be handled. Because when you start getting, if your game actually gets popular and people start playing it, you're going to that chance that it's going to happen is going to go way up. But obviously, you can see I'm trying to do this here, and it's just not working, and that's because I'm doing the appropriate amount of collision checks that I need to do. So that is why there are so many collision checks here in the broad phase, and it's the reason that I recheck the same corners twice. All right, so now that I've gone over that, I'm going to go over one more thing, which is a, a design issue that you may run into if you decide to design your level map a little bit differently than I have here. And that's another fallback of this, this approach to doing tile-based collision detection and response, is that you really have to be on top of your level design and you really have to be um, intentional with the way you place your tiles. They have to be where they're meant to be. And 
if it's anything short of that, you are going to have weird problems. So to show you what I'm talking about, I'm going to replace this seven tile here with a 12 tile, save that, and this tile is now going to become a half slope tile. All right, so you might already know where I'm going with this because of the place of my, of my tiles. I have no problem here because this is not conflict here. These two tiles don't conflict from this side. These tiles do, however, have a conflict from this side. If I start climbing this slope tile, um, this would be expected. You would expect to stop here and stop here and, and no longer be able to fit through that gap. But since we're just doing X and Y collision checks and only one axis can prevail, or one direction on one axis can prevail, I'm actually going to move through one of these shapes. And it looks like on that, instance, I move through the slope tile. So this is a design problem that you might run into. It's really not an issue if you design your levels properly. I mean, if you really want a little uh, cubby space right here where you can move your character and have him stop like that, I'm sure there's a way you can do it. I haven't figured it out. I never really saw a need to have this in a game. It would be cool. But it's definitely a, a pain to program just looking at it. I can tell it would be a mind bender to get your head around that one. So just be intentional with where you place your tiles and understand that all of these tiles have a very specific application. A good example would be this tile here. This tile is meant to be a right-facing wall tile. It shouldn't. You should never be able to enter this tile from its left side. So in your game design, you have to ensure that this tile is only ever exposed to the inside of the map unless you want to use it as a platform tile. So that's all I'm saying. With this method, with this approach, you really want to be intentional about your, your level layout and your level design. And you just have to keep in mind that what you're gaining from this is modularity, where you can reuse um, narrow phase collision detection methods inside of routing functions. For example, if I go down to my tile 5, which is this square tile here, I'm reusing a bunch of different narrow phase collision methods to create this square. So it's really useful, it's really modular, you can do a lot of stuff with it, it's kind of powerful, and it's not super CPU intensive. So it has its ups, and as you can see, it also has its downsides. But other than that, you can do basically anything you want with it. So I hope you guys got something out of this first video. I am going to have three more after this. This was just about the broad phase and the, the concept of it. The next three are going to be actually about narrow phase collision detection and the nitty gritty of what goes on when you collide with a specific tile type. So my next video, the second in this series, is going to be on platform tiles and composite platform tiles like this one. It's a composite because it's a composite of all these different platforming narrow phase collision methods. Uh, tutorial three is going to be on slope tiles, which are highlighted here in green. You're going to learn about how to do slope tiles, half height slope tiles, and different problems you might run into with slope tiles. And finally, my th fourth and final video in the series, I keep wanting to say third because I start counting at zero, but really it's the fourth because in real life you count starting at one. Uh, but I'm going to go over curve tiles, which are really cool. As you can see, you have the, a cool little object that you can put into a game, and players are going to be intrigued by it because no one really implements this sort of thing. So stay tuned for those videos, and I hope you guys learned something today. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.